Welcome everyone from me, John Denton, to another podcast in the Business Ready for Sale series. Because a business that's ready for sale is well worth keeping, these podcasts are for all business owners. And the topic today that I've chosen is back from the brink. And my guest today on this podcast is Kelly Mine from Avior Consulting. So welcome, Kelly. Great to Pleasure to be here, John. Great to have you here. Um, Kelly's uh, a Canadian, but has lived in Perth for 20 years now, so we can almost call him a, a West Aussie. And Kelly is a partner with the Perth financial advisory firm, Avior Consulting, where he is in charge of corporate restructuring and insolvency. So Kelly's restructuring experience spans 12 years and covers small and large engagements in many different industries. He's also familiar with what it's like at the coalface of financial distress, having held senior finance roles with different small businesses that required and successfully undertook financial resizing in order to survive. Because of Kelly's um, experience with insolvencies and businesses on the brink of going under, we were chatting recently at a business function about the COVID pandemic and the effect that it's having on businesses and how a lot of businesses are struggling. And that's probably going to get worse when the government assistance that's in place at the moment winds down or, or goes off. And it was while talking about that that Kelly told me about a new law that's come into being in Australia, which I believe some, a lot of business owners, in fact, and, and quite a lot of accountants don't even know about. And um, yeah, it's to help businesses that, that are on the brink. So Kelly, tell us a little bit about yourself first, and then a little bit about this law that's come in. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, so the, our firm, Avior Consulting, we our business is to assist companies that are in finan difficult financial circumstances, but are attempting to achieve certain goals. And as part of achieving those goals, some sort of formal insolvency appointment under Australia's insolvency laws is often required. And with what we've gone through during the pandemic and the steep decline of economic activity that occurred during that period, um, the government watched that happen and anticipated that things would likely get worse and had a strong inclination to assist small businesses to the extent that it could. And as a result of that, a new set of laws, um, the small business insolvency reform set of laws were introduced in December and became law on the 1st of January. And in terms of back from the brink, um, what we're talking about today, the key set of laws that addresses that is a new set of restructuring laws that are specifically designed for small businesses. And these are different from what we've had in the past um, because of the government's attempt at creating something that is um, especially for smaller businesses. And, um, and they really matter. And the reason why they are different is um, the key reason why is because with the, this new set of laws, the directors remain in control of the company whilst going through it. The other types of insolvency that are available, the insolvency appointments like liquidations and administrations, that is not the case. And those uh, under those regimes, the directors hand over the keys to someone like me. But, that, but that's not the case with restructuring. And the, so I am involved, but I am there to be an advisor and I am there for the company. And that is also something that is quite different as compared to the other types of insolvency solutions there are. Um, in this case, I'm there for the company and not there on behalf of the creditors. So that, that is something else and something more um, important to keep in mind. And the other thing about these laws, the way and the fact that they've been designed so that the directors remain in control, is that it with they are 
hopefully set up in such a way so that they'll encourage companies, small, small businesses, to come forward and seek assistance and take action toward dealing with their financial difficulty sooner. Uh, because by taking action, action sooner, um, the likelihood of achieving a, a positive outcome is, is much better. So it's, it's a new set of laws that came into being here at the beginning of 2021. And um, I give the government credit for uh, attempting to come up with something like this. And we're eager to see how um, the time will unfold and how businesses will go in trying to put the new laws into effect. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I think when you and I had the conversation, uh, Kelly, I mentioned the word phoenixing, which um, is something that's happened in the past. And a, a few insolvency people had mentioned to me that under the uh, with the government handouts and businesses being propped up by those handouts, that the tendency to phoenix... Um, and my understanding of phoenixing is where um, the directors set up another entity and move the assets across from the struggling entity into the new entity and then let the old entity fail where the creditors and everybody loses out. So this is almost like the way I see it, enabling that kind of thing to happen. But legally, is am I seeing it right or... Yes, I, I think that what was happening previously without the, this, this set of laws is um, business owners and, and the, the, depending on the, the type of circumstances they were confronted with, there was a, a, a behavior out there. Um, I haven't seen as many examples of that happening in Western Australia, but it's, it does sound like it's more visible in, in the Eastern states. And as a, as a way of keeping a business alive and keeping it going, that, that type of behavior of moving the business from one legal entity to the next and, and, and down the line as a chain, it did happen. And it did happen in circumstances where the assets were transferred for less than what they were worth. And that's what created the problem. Hmm. The assets were transferred for less than their worth, which meant that the, the, the company that transferred them did not uh, receive appropriate consideration for dealing with its debts, with, with dealing with its liabilities. And so with, with these new laws, um, in terms of uh, addressing that problem, um, I've, that uh, I, I think that it can help address it. I, I think that it can help be a solution um, in that the, you have a situation where the, the directors, rather than taking the other way out of a phoenix, which is illegal and has definitely has legal consequences to the extent that, that, that you are caught, um, there is a way of dealing with the debts that much sooner in a way that is condoned by the government and in which, uh, which uh, the, the, the new laws actually help you take you through. Okay, so this is um, obviously a, a, a better way for businesses to deal with the situation and it's better for the creditors as well. So what, what are the other advantages of the, the news laws? Obviously, the directors stay involved. You come in and help them to restructure. What, what happens then? In entering into the process, the first thing that needs to be considered is whether or not a company is eligible. And so there are certain eligibility criteria that, that need to be addressed. And the key one in entering the process is that the company cannot have debts any more than $1 million. So the, the, that is number one. Now, having entered into the process, uh, appointing a, a restructuring practitioner, then the clock starts ticking in terms of there being 20 business days for the directors with the assistance of the restructuring practitioner and other professional advisors, such as the accountant, um, to develop a plan whereby the creditors um, will receive a return of something cents in the dollar. And so that process of developing that, that plan continues for 20 business days. At the end of that period, restructuring practitioner sends out the, the plan, distributes it uh, along with his declaration. Uh, that declaration states 
that in the, the, the restructuring practitioner's view, that the plan is achievable, that the information is complete. And having sent that out, then creditors have 15 business days to respond. And when in responding, they are voting on whether or not they accept the plan. And if a majority in value vote in favor of the plan, then it will be implemented. And, and, that, and at that stage, the restructuring practitioner takes control of the, the implementation. It gets in the funds from the company according to what the terms of the plan are, and then is responsible for paying it out. And at the end of that process, the, whatever those creditor claims were uh, in that, that were dealt with as part of that plan, um, those, the value of those claims are removed from the company's balance sheet. Just going back to the eligibility bit again, and that million dollar of debt, what can that debt be? What does it include? But the, the, those debts, that million dollars in debts, is basically all types of debts held by the company except for employee entitlements. So employee entitlements and superannuation, that is payable. Um, and so that can be um, trade creditors, the ATO, bank debt, um, related party loans, um, they all fit into that category and, um, and are required to be no more than 1 million. Okay, so if, if a business is got debts or believe they've got debts over a, a million, should they still come and talk to you anyway? Um, absolutely, absolutely. There, um, I think that it, it, that one million dollar threshold should not necessarily be a, um, from the director's perspective, um, a, a stop button in terms of whether or not to proceed. It is still very much worthwhile having a conversation with someone like myself to see if there is anything that can be done to manage those debts. And in a way that is legally, we can remove some of that debt off of the company's balance sheet so that at the time that um, we're ready to start the process, you're, you're under the 1 million. Um, but then what will likely be the outcome is that in addition to um, developing a restructuring plan within the company, it will also include um, having to deal with the debts that may not be present now because they, we, we've reduced it down to below 1 million. So that, that would de that's definitely that's something that should be ignored just because it's, it, it, it is required at the time that you enter into it that you're under 1 million. And, um, and if you're not under 1 million um, and it turns out later that you are above, then um, there is a likelihood that the, the process will terminate. Um, so that, that consideration needs to be looked at carefully. Right. So anything else on the eligibility um, front? Yes. Uh, so th that, um, th th it's good that you, point, you ask about that, John, because there is a little bit more to the eligibility criteria. Um, the key thing is that when you enter the process uh, about the debts being above, um, below um, $1 million, and then as you go through the process and develop the plan during that 20 business day period, it, at the, the time that the restructuring plan is ready to be signed and distributed to creditors, the additional points that need to be addressed and satisfied is that employee entitlements need to be paid up. Whatever is due and payable has had to have been paid at that time, at that moment in time. And also at that time, all ATO lodgements need to be up to date. So uh, just a bit of complexity in the overall process is that the eligibility criteria is that there are two kind of signposts that, that you need to look at when you're going through is where are you at at the beginning? And that's where the million dollars applies. And then as you go through it and develop the plan is the other two need to be considered then and, and complied with. Mm, so is, is the, those are the eligibility criteria that, that need to be considered. Yeah, so this is where you guys earn your money because you know all those sort of things and can work the business owners through it. Correct, correct. And, it, 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 so, and, and because of these different elements, um, it is um, 
it's, it's not only coming to someone like myself and saying, I'm ready to appoint you and let's start forming a plan together. It's the, the, um, there's, there's probably, there will be scope and uh, prudence in spending time planning the process even before a restructuring pr practitioner is appointed. Um, and not only the, in the sense of you, you want to make sure that you take advantage and you are well within the 20 business days, but if for some reason the process works, and, and this is an important planning consideration, if for some reason the process doesn't work, and um, for some reason it needs to terminate, then the company will not be able to attempt the process again for seven years. Wow, seven years. That's a bit of a sting in the tail in this overall process. And that um, additionally, going back to your comment earlier about the, the phoenix, phoenixing, that is one of the ways, that's a, a key way that the, the, the government discourages that. Um, type of behavior because if, if you could do it um, serially then you could restructure and uh, over and over again and and that would probably not um, be what your creditors want to see it happen over and over again yeah sure it's um it seems to me that, that the advantages of going down this path are that you know the directors or the owners stay in control of the business um you're there to work with the business owners you're not there representing the creditors and yeah as, as you said before it in, encourages the business owners to take action early and not wait until it's too late what, what about the clients what happens with the the clients of the business while this is all going on um uh, so with the uh, with the creditors of, of the business um, you know, they are present, and so it, there's a, a couple of layers to the response to that question, when it's a very good one. Um, number one, um, the, the, the creditor's claims up to the date when the restructuring practitioner is appointed are frozen. Um, they are, they're, a moratorium around those debts has now been put in place, and that moratorium is is similar to what exists now with voluntary administration. And, and by moratorium, that means that those creditor claims, those creditors cannot take any further enforcement action. So that includes statutory demands, pursuing a winding up application, um, debt recovery, um, that all needs to end when the restructuring practitioner is appointed. And then as to going, going forward, um, the, the, yes, the, the company continues to trade, the directors remain in control, and it'll be at the, the suppliers, the, the creditors' decision as to whether or not they choose to continue trading with the company whilst it's going through this process. And so uh, back to a, a further planning consideration is the need to um, have those conversations with suppliers uh, as relevant beforehand so that when the, um, the, the, the appointment does happen, um, they are on board. Because one of the, the legal requirements in entering into the, the, the restructuring is that um, where all public documents, basically anything that goes out to customers, creditors, or what have you, it, in relation to the company's name, it has to have restructuring practitioner appointed after it. Oh, okay. So, and, and that only needs to be present whilst we're developing the plan and, and up, up until the point the vote happens. And so it's, it's, it's a total of 35 business days. At the end of that process, once the plan is voted for and presumably accepted, then that type of disclosure is no longer needed. Mm, okay. So, Interesting. Um, but the point is it's going to be out there and it'll likely raise questions. And so there'll have to be there'll have consideration will be needed as to how those are dealt with. So as to um, not adversely, you know, cause adverse behavior or their decision to, to stop trading with you um, during that process. Mm, okay. 
So there's quite a lot involved. What, um, like with the company's accountants who would typically be quite often the, the people to pick up the fact that the business is in trouble um, and should be working with the business owners anyway, what role does the accountant have in all of this? I think it's a, yeah, I, I think it's a, a very good opportunity for accountants and, and that they, they should be involved. And uh, I hope to see that they pick up the reins and have a deep level of involvement. Um, one, it gives them the opportunity to um, get deeper into the relationship or, or, or dive deeper into the relationship. Um, the, and the all around developing the solution and the restructuring plan. Um, number two, um, the way that it's managed and in anticipation of the company surviving, um, it's the opportunity to retain the client. Um, so, the, and uh, as compared to uh, liquidation or administration, where um, unfortunately often the company doesn't survive, does not go back to the accountant, this is different. And lastly, the 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 role. I mean, the, the, it's not just providing information that sort of thing. There's no reason why. Um, depending on the nature of the restructuring plan that's developed, they can be the ones who, um, for example, prepare the financial forecast that underpins the plan. Um, they already had a lot, have a lot of the information. And so in terms of working with the directors, um, preparing the financial forecast and its assumptions, um, uh, from my perspective, I'm very happy to see that. And the, often they are in the best position to develop that. So the, the accountant, the, the, the incumbent external accountant, I think, has a, a very strong role to play in this. And, and, and I hope that you know, as they learn more about the laws, that, that, that they see themselves in that role. I mean, John, it actually even extends further that the laws are set up so that should um, accountants have an interest um, or, or a desire to um, pursue um, small business restructuring, um, they, they, their firm, um, the, the partners of that firm can become restructuring practitioners themselves. And the, the, the laws are set up that way. And so that, that is something that, that uh, a further element that, that, that can be, be explored if they are, they're interested in having their business go in that direction. Hmm. Does that make them competitors for you? Um, I think in potentially in this space, um, anecdotally, uh, from what I've seen, and, and I appreciate that there are many good accountants out there and, and many account, ac accounting firms, um, but anecdotally, the, the ones that I have talked to so far have generally expressed the view that they're going to stick with what they know they're good at and, um, and leave this to me, um, just because once you get into the, 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 this part of the, the new insolvency laws, they they rapidly they rapidly overlap overlap into other parts of insolvency law that they definitely would not normally cover. Yeah, yeah, and, and there's a lot more to the the process from what you've explained in terms of the planning and working with all the parties involved. Yeah. I couldn't yeah. really see an accountant wanting to get involved in those parts of the process. Correct, correct, and that, and and so, and I, I just to um, clarify a bit, um, the the accounts who wish to get into this space as a restructuring practitioner, um, they can do so, and there is a, um, a a criteria, an application process. But once you've satisfied that, then all you're doing is re, uh, small business restructuring. You're not doing liquidations, administrations, receiverships. Um, that kind of turnaround work that remains carved out of the way that the laws were changed to encourage accountants to come in. Mm. Yeah. So really, the, it's there's a role there for the accountants, but it's not. And how can I put it? It's complementary to what you're doing for the businesses. Yes. Yes, that's right. It's complementary. That's a good word in terms of the idea and and the way that we attempt to. Um, we strive to work when we are you know, working on a turnaround assignment is um, the, the people, the, the other um, financial advisors, other professionals involved that we all work collaboratively and we complement 
each other's skill sets. So um, I think that to the extent that they're they're performing the roles, the activities that, that I've explained, and I'm monitoring compliance with the overall process, making sure that the creditors are being measured accurately, dealing with disputes that arise as we're going through the process or at the time that the voting um, is is being, uh, that process is happening, um, we can work well together. Yeah, and I can see, um, I wouldn't want to take a lot of that stuff on, I'm sure a lot of accountants wouldn't want to either. So, uh, but, um, yes. So yeah, it, it's really interesting. And how can business owners find out about this? I mean, like when we had the conversation, I was totally unaware that these changes have come in. I'm happy to have a conversation with them so they can contact us. Um, we'll ha I'll have my details um, uh, with John um, that, that will be available at the end of this podcast. Um, we're located in West Perth and happy to have a, an obligation-free discussion and we'll see where it leads to. Our view is that if we can add value, then we will um, suggest a way for us to be involved. But if we can't and we, we, we still can have a, a useful chat that comes up with some good ideas, but there is no role for us, then that, that's fine. That, that's, that's, we're, we're comfortable with that outcome as well. Um, there, there are a, a couple of other planning considerations, um, John, that I uh, thought it would be good for the listeners to understand um, in, in looking at this overall process. Um, you know, the, the planning considerations that we covered were um, the fact that if you undertake this, or the, that we've covered already, um, if you undertake this process, recognizing that you can only do it once every seven years, so it, it has to be approached carefully and with a, a, a deliberate mindset. And um, it, in, in terms of, uh, although the restructuring practitioner is there to act on behalf of the company, um, there has to be a commercial consideration as to what, what creditors will accept and likely vote for um, so that the process isn't wasted. Um, Another element that we haven't talked about is uh, planning consideration is whatever the plan is, um, the plan can, uh, it can include um, an asset being contributed by the director to the, into the company, which in turn is sold or something like that. And the proceeds from that is paid to, the, to deal with the creditor claims, or it can deal with future profits. Um, that is not unusual, um, but, it, to the extent that it d deals with something, some sort of uh, future event, future profits, whatever that is, um, that the time frame cannot extend beyond three years. Mm, okay. So th that that is something else to keep in mind. Um, the the last uh, I'll say that I don't know. Well, there's two other items that will will need to be thought about when we look at the undertaking the restructuring. Number one is. Um, if we let's just, for example, if we had a company that had, um, debts at the beginning of the restructuring process of $800,000 and as a result of the restructuring process, th that, that 800,000 was reduced to 200,000. So we removed 600,000 of liabilities from the balance sheet. Well, there is a tax consequence of that and which needs to be considered, um, if there are losses in the past, then those, though that that um, debt forgiveness, which has happened, the six hundred thousand dollars in debt forgiveness, um, will absorb those losses. But otherwise, that debt forgiveness, the six hundred thousand, is actually a, a gain, a gain on the, the that needs to be recorded on the company's tax return. And so uh, I, I, I'm. I'm the insolvency practitioner, the restructuring practitioner, and um, I know when I shouldn't dabble into things that I don't know very much about, which is um, the, the, the more the tax planning, but I can see that it has um, consequences in at the furthest extreme, having to recognize that the, the, the tax, uh, the, the debt forgiveness as income, which has a corresponding tax payable component. So that, that is that, that is another element that will need to be looked at. 
the, the final uh, planning consideration is personal guarantees. And personal guarantees, um, the, the listeners, they, they'd be very familiar with them and they're required on lots of occasions in terms of opening up some sort of credit, um, dealing with the credit application to start trade. And the, the one thing to understand with the new process is that like administration, like um, deeds of company arrangement, um, the, the restructuring plan that is ultimately entered into, hopefully successfully, is that it will not deal with personal guarantees. Personal guarantees will stay there and, and the directors will need to deal with them. Um, so that, in, in terms of how, uh, th there's a lot of different components that, that need to be considered when we put it up on the whiteboard and we, we, we look at this on, on, uh, at the, the financial reports. Um, and the, the personal guarantees is, is just another one in terms of how it's, they're ultimately going to be dealt with. Um, just because just with a, a, a supplier with um, a personal guarantee, just because they're getting 20 cents on the dollar on the debt that is owed by the company, doesn't mean, it doesn't prevent it from going after the director to recover the 80 cents. Mm, okay, that's interesting. It's um, just thinking while you were, talking there one of the challenges that i come up against uh, in helping business owners get their businesses ready for a sale or assess how saleable the business is it's getting their up-to-date financials off them <laughs> i mean i keep putting this message out to business owners but you know there is no excuse these days for not having your financials up to date um i can imagine that, for you, it would be similar. If you're going to get involved with a business, then, you know, their financials need to be current, right? Yes, correct, correct. And um, it, it wasn't as necessary or it's, it's not as necessary in relation to liquidations and administrations. Um, in, in those cases, we take the company's books and records as we find them and, and deal with them as best we can. Um, and um, because... In those cases, you, we've drawn a line in the sand and it's just, it just, it probably all just stops. Whereas it, with the restructuring of the new laws, um, there is the anticipation that things carry forward. And in order for things to carry forward and to, for, for the, the laws to be complied with, it's uh, as you're saying, and, and as you, the, with, the, with the message that you give to the companies that you deal with, it is essential that the company's financials are up to date. And as part of that planning process, we can assist with that in terms of providing guidance, but on the day when the restructuring begins, when and the, the 20 business day clock starts ticking, um, it's important that the financials are up to date and especially that the creditor claims are complete because it, it we wouldn't want to find out Afterwards, once we're in the process, that the company's debts are actually 1.1 million. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the so message: I have your I financial. Support that idea 100%, John. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how people make good decisions in their business without up-to-date financials. Anyway, I mean, you know, to me, it's an instrument panel, and if you're flying without instruments, well, anything can happen. Yes, so, agreed on that. And then when you come to sell the business or you go into a restructure or whatever, um, it's just so hard if, yeah, if you've got to go back and start working through all those those numbers. So, Kelly, that's been great. I'm sure this is going to help a lot of business owners. Can you just summarize for us the, the sort of process if a business is coming to you? Um, just what are the steps? Sure. All right. So the, the steps that would be that a company that is in some sort of financial distress and it doesn't, and, and this financial distress is just general. It, it could have been caused by the, the pandemic, um, whatever it is. Um, and, and also, uh, John, it's, I, I, I will go through the process, but it's also point, important to point out that these laws are permanent. They are not going anywhere. Um, they are not temporary um, because of this time that we find ourselves in. 
um, with uh, coming out of COVID. Um, they will remain there and will be available to small businesses going forward indefinitely. But as a company that is did, experiencing some sort of financial difficulty, they will, uh, I encourage them to come to a firm like ours that specializes in assisting companies in financial difficulty achieve goals. And as part of our conversations, if we let's suppose that we determine that they are a candidate for small business restructuring, then we will have regard to where things are at in terms of the accounts, the, the financial reporting, um, like you mentioned earlier, as to what work needs to be done to bring that up to date and um, uh, assessing uh, the certain planning considerations as to wh where, what's going to be the outcome here or, and, and the consequences. And um, if there's personal guarantees, if there are tax consequences, um, what do we need to do to plan to make sure that those don't trip things up once we get to the point that the plan has been voted upon? Having done those things and established that the company meets the criteria that its debts are no more than a million dollars, then they are ready to appoint a restructuring practitioner. And we, having done so, some a firm like ours would get involved and it, and likely the account, but it doesn't have to be the account. It can only be, it, it may only be us. Um, we have very good accounting skills as well in terms of going through this process and forecasting that sort of thing. Um, but it, uh, having the account along and being involved makes really good commercial sense, I would expect. So we are now in the, the restructuring period, which lasts for 20 business days. And at the end of that 20 business day period, there, there needs to be a plan that is developed that offers the creditors in mind um, a certain return. And, and, and what that needs to look like, that is up to the directors. It is, um, it is a very flexible concept um, and, and where the money comes from or future profits or that sort of thing, it's all on the table. And so, 20 days elapses, we are, that's finished. And by that 20 day period, then the, the restructuring plan is signed off. Um, not only is it signed off by the directors, but it's signed off by the restructuring practitioner um, who in, in his declaration states that the um, plan is achievable and that it is complete. And then that information is distributed to creditors to consider and to vote on. And that period lasts for 15 business days. And at the end of that period, the creditors are required to have, have our, um, they, they can participate if they choose to. Um, and, but the ones that do, of those ones that vote, um, if there is a majority in value voting in favor of the plan, then the plan has been accepted and it will bind all creditors that were in place on the day that the company entered into the process, which was basically 35 business days ago. Um, and at that point then the plan will be enacted and whatever that plan involved, it's somehow going to involve, um, result in um, a cash amount being put in the hands of the restructuring practitioner and it's the restriction practitioner's responsibility to distribute those funds to the creditors as agreed. So it only requires a majority of the creditors to vote for it, not all of them. Majority in value um, voting. So um, you could you could uh, um, imagine that um, a a company has twenty creditors that are relevant, but uh, and and it often happens. Um, of those 20, only five vote. The other 15, for whatever reason, they did not want to be involved. And of the five, as long as that five, um, that the, the there is a majority in value uh, out of that five supporting the plan, then that plan will proceed and it will bind all 20 creditors. Wow. Okay. Now, now there is, there, there is, you know, that is all quite simplistic. There will be things to consider like the bank, for example, if it has a, a the type of security 
that it likely has, whether there are leases, um, higher purchase, um, they have an effect on this uh, as well. But generally in an overall covering the process, um, as those getting those votes in and getting to the point where I, someone like me implements the plan. And at the end of that, um, and, and it can extend for, uh, last for up to three years. Um, so it's quite a long period of time. Um, then having achieved that, then all those debts um, will have been removed from the company's balance sheet or, 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 will, or re reduced down to whatever was agreed. No, okay, wow. All righty, uh, we're running out of time, Kelly. It's time to, to wrap up. So how can people contact you? Um, they can reach out to me directly at, um, so my email address is k and mine, M-E-Y-N at avierconsulting.com.au. My mobile is 0439-962-927. And our office number six one four five zero seven hundred in Perth. So a zero eight in front of the and a zero eight in front. That's <laughs> correct, John. Yes. All right, fantastic. And um, yeah, I, I want to thank you very much. It's been really enlightening, and yeah, I think it is a really good initiative on the part of the government uh, to do this. We just need to get the message out there to business owners and accountants and all those people. That's correct. Yeah, and I'm eager to see how it um, unfolds and how it's embraced. But I, I agree with you. I think the government has, has a, certainly conceptually has done a, a very good thing to help small business so that we're we're no longer using a um, what has been a one size fits all sort of approach. Yeah, and it's interesting that it's ongoing and not just during the pandemic. Um, not that I'm not sure how we're going to know the pandemic's over, <laughs> but yes, uh, good point. Hmm. So, all right, that's fantastic. Thank you. And for anyone who is interested, any business owners interested in getting their business ready for sale or having a business ready for sale assessment, then they can contact me through johndenton.com.au or have a look at my online workshops and memberships at johndenton.online. So thank you, Kelly, and thank you, everyone, for coming on and listening. And, yeah, look forward to the next episode in the Business Ready for Sale podcast series. Thanks, John. It's a pleasure. So, folks, just to summarise that chat with Kelly Mine from Avior Consulting, these new laws are there to help small businesses return from what would otherwise be the brink of insolvency. So they permit this in a way that enables a company to improve its financial circumstances much faster than would be the case if the directors dug in, more than likely over an extended period, and paid the debts with future profits. So back from the brink then can be achieved in as little as 35 days, 35 business days, or less than two months. At the moment, not a lot of business owners and even a lot of accountants aren't aware of the law and what it can do to help small business. So hopefully this podcast will help to get the message out. And if you want any more information from Kelly, his email address again is K for Kelly, M-E-Y for Yankee, N, K-M-E-Y-N at A-V-I-O-R -A consulting, all one word, avrconsulting.com.au and if you want any more information from me you can contact me on john at johndenton.com.au or through the website johndenton.com.au so looking forward to the next podcast and another interesting interview soon bye for now